À frente de duas mil organizações não governamentais, em 1988, ele fundou a Marcha Global contra o Trabalho Infantil. Indicado para o Prêmio Nobel da Paz em 2006 e novamente agora, em 2013, o indiano Kailash Satyarthi já resgatou ou libertou milhares de meninos e meninas escravizadas em todo o mundo. Ele é o nosso convidado do Cidadania. Welcome, Mr. Satyarthi. Thank you. Sete anos atrás, quando o senhor esteve no Brasil, uh, as estatísticas apontavam 218 milhões de crianças em trabalho no mundo, desses 20 milhões em condições de escravidão. What did it change? These numbers have changed. Esses números mudaram? Definitely, there is significant change in the numbers. The number of child laborers in the world have dropped down to 168 million. And the report was released only last week. So that is a significant progress. But 168 million is also a very big number worldwide. Many of these children are sold and bought like animals and even in lesser prices than the animals. They are denied education, they are denied human rights, they are denied their uh, present and future. So this is a big number. O senhor, quando tinha uma pouca idade, ainda era um menino, e viu com o seu pai crianças engraxando sapato é, na escola, é, indo, quando o senhor estava indo para a escola. E isso lhe causou uma profunda impressão. Eu queria que o senhor descrevesse essa sua experiência. So, what a surprise that you know about my childhood. Uh, well, when I went to uh, my school for the first time, in the first day of schooling, I found a boy of my age, five or six year old. And he was sitting along with his father uh, and they were shoe shiners. And it stuck to my mind that me and all my colleagues were going with a lot of enthusiasm, with new clothes, new books, new things, uh, with new dreams actually. Um, and a boy was looking at us, uh, whether we can give some job to him to shine our shoes, but we, our shoes were new shoes, so there was no, no way. When I went to school, uh, it was still in my mind, so after introduction I asked my teacher and later on to my headmaster one simple question that why this child is sitting outside and we are all in school. I might have seen children working before, but that was the first very direct contradictory situation. So these people, uh, that my teachers, Uh, convinced me that they are poor children and it's not new, it's very common, they have to work to earn their livelihood. When I went back from the school, I saw the boy next day and next day and I was getting more and more angry in myself that nobody was giving an answer. So within a week or so, I gathered all my courage and I went straight to the father of the boy because both of them used to work. They were working in open sky. Uh, so I asked the father that, why don't you send your son to school? And he replied after a while, uh, as it was a very tough question for him. He said, sir, I have never thought on it because my father started since childhood. I started chi since childhood and so my son. And then he said, we are born to work. And I was stunned in that why some people are born to work and why some people like me are born to become doctors and engineers and professors and scientists and what not, politicians. And for a six-year-old boy, I was not even six, it was very difficult to understand these complexities of caste system in India because they were born in a particular caste, they were born as poor, socially excluded. So um, that That made me really angry, and um, I wanted to do something. Uh, so once I, uh, I was uh, studying, I started helping the poor children by way of collecting some money, collecting some books, and distributing books to the poor children, making sure that they are educated. And that went on for quite some time. O senhor é considerado responsável pela liberdade de centenas de milhares de crianças em todo o mundo. Até que ponto a pobreza pode ser relacionada com a causa principal do trabalho infantil? 
Well, the child labor, poverty, and illiteracy form a triangular relationship. And they have a kind of chicken and egg relations, cause and consequence relationship. For instance, if child labor continues, then the poverty continues. But if poverty continues, child labor will continue. That is a direct relation. So is the issue of education. If the children are not educated, they will go to work. But if they are going to work, they can never be educated. And if the children remain illiterate, they will remain poor. But if the people remain poor for whole life, they would not be properly educated. So that becomes a full circle. And we have to break this circle. Today in the world, as I said, 168 million children are in full-time jobs and 200 million adults are jobless. 57 million primary age uh, children, primary school age children, are out of school. And altogether, 132 million children are out of the school uh, up to the age of 16, then they have to be in a school. So that, that is very clear that how this works. Children are the cheapest source of labor. Children are free labor. Children are easily to be exploited. So the people prefer them in work, and they will remain poor. But let me also underline here that children are not the creators of poverty. They are not responsible for poverty. We adults are responsible for poverty. Our politics, our economics, our social life is responsible for the poverty of these poor children. So poverty is no excuse for slavery. No excuse. Até que ponto o senhor vem usando a publicidade e a publicidade, os recursos da publicidade no combate ao trabalho infantil? Well, media is very, very important. Both the mainstream media, the newspapers and news channels and so on, uh, and now the social media. But when I started my fight against child labor almost 30 years ago, that time uh, there were no too many channels. In India, for instance, there was just one uh, news channel uh, owned by the government of India. So there were no private channel. There was not nothing like satellite channels and so on. In you 19- mean television? Television so channels. So follow yeah. canal de televisão. Yeah, television channels. There were not any television ch- channel except one official channel, official TV. Uh, there also, uh, there were newspapers, of course, but for newspapers, it was not a big issue for them or there was no, it was a non-issue. But since we were not exposing the stories alone, but we were fighting it out. I used to go and rescue children physically. Sometimes we were attacked. Sometimes we were in serious dangers. And the children come out and tell their stories. That was uh, interest of the media. And that media has helped a lot in multiplying the message within country and also some international media like uh, BBC or CNN and th- th- these big TV channels, uh, they have taken it up. And it has become slowly uh, a big issue globally, not just in India. So uh, media was very, very important. And it's still very important. I I know that uh, without the communication through the media, we cannot reach out to large number of people. And that is most important because you cannot, uh, you know, uh, liberate every single child labor on your own. It, the message has to be multiplied like wildfire. And I strongly believe that everybody has an element of passion for children. Everybody has an element of you know, respect for children. But that element has to be taken out, to be unleashed, and that is possible through the media. O senhor pensa, de alguma forma, que a caracterização do trabalho infantil como algo cultural, algo algo historicamente cultural de alguns povos, de algumas regiões, pode ser uma, man- uma maneira de disfarçar o trabalho infantil e torná-lo mais tolerável? Actually, the what I say in my country, in India, but also in Brazil, I have traveled uh, extensively in some parts of Brazil, and I have been coming here for many years. So I have met the poorest of the poor people in northeast, uh, eastern regions, and I have been to the farms and fields and brick making 
places and stone quarries and uh, many places. So I, uh, while chatting to the people, they feel that it is a tradition, it goes on, nothing is, uh, is uh, special in it because it's the way of life. It is changing, definitely, it's changing worldwide, but still the people feel that it's a part of traditional livelihood. Um, because they have no other option in life, they had no dreams, and no sincere, serious efforts have been made by the ruling elite or by the rich class to give them new dreams in life, to get out of that kind of vicious circle of poverty and child labor. So uh, that traditional mindset has has been there and is still there. But I'm, I'm very happy to say that it is changing very fast because people see value in education. Earlier, education was considered only as means of employment. Now people started feeling that it's a means of empowerment. It's a means of social justice. It's a means or a key to get into uh, mainstream economy. So that is very important. O senhor mesmo disse que já esteve várias vezes aqui no Brasil desde 1997 e tomou conhecimento de programas como o PET, o Programa de Erradicação do Trabalho Infantil, o Programa da Bolsa Escola, a Bolsa Família. E que avaliação o senhor faz dos, go dos programas governamentais? Well, we know that there are still serious problems in Brazil. But in spite of that, let me tell you that Brazil is path breaker. It has shown light to the whole world. When this Bolsa Scola has been launched, uh, I had a chance to come and meet then uh, Governor of Brasilia, Cristobal Varak, and uh, he, he was very excited about it. And we see the value in it. Um, we saw that how this conditional cash transfer program for schooling of children has helped not only in the state of Brasilia, but it has grown beyond it. And uh, the serious problem of street children, which was linked with crime and drugs and so on 20 years ago, in, in Rio, for instance, in some parts of Sao Paulo, it has also slowly changed and the people started valuing education and sending their children to schools instead of putting them on the streets because they could get some incentive. The mothers got some incentive. And when it was expanded by President Lula uh, and continued a bigger program as the Bolsa Familia, it, uh, it has embraced many more issues of society as a social protection system. Uh, and that is also a kind of very strong example of convergence of policies. The policies related to poli uh, child labor eradication or right to children, the policies on education and poverty reduction and health, uh, women empowerment, they have merged together and it has been very, very important. And that did not remain confined to uh, Brazil only, then some other uh, Latin American states followed it up, Chile for instance and other places, Peru a little bit, uh, and then it has gone beyond it. it has it has been taken by Tanzania as conditional cash transfer program in Sri Lanka, uh, in Asia. So that has become, as I said, a kind of torch uh, to the rest of the world. Of course, there are some difficulties in it uh, that could be solved. But more important was that a principle of convergence of policies uh, in favor of poor people has been uh, practiced here. Brasil e Índia fazem parte do grupo dos BRICS. Brasil, Rússia, Índia, China e África do Sul. É, o que nós poderíamos aprender do combate ao trabalho infantil nesses outros países do mesmo grupo? Well, uh, BRICS is a very important uh, group of nations. And they have to play as in my opinion, very, very important role in every sphere of life, particularly the global economy and global politics, both. But simultaneously, they may have to play a very important role in eradication of child labor and educating their children. Uh, we don't have much knowledge, inside knowledge about China, because even now it is, it is quite hidden. But sometimes 
it is exposed that child labor were found and the Chinese government took some actions and so on. Um, but uh, in Brazil, in India, South uh, Africa, um, Russia, we have knowledge about the problem. So the sharing of good practices is very important. And that, um, that can work. Like in some parts of India, the education has been achieved uh, of very high quality. So when it comes to the quality education, uh, that is something which can be learned by other countries and also other states in India. So more South-South learning, more South-South cooperation uh, is possible. And I, I think that it would be uh, uh, a new leadership in the world once big countries really take this issue up. Um, we tried as the Global March. Uh, I had that uh, dream to convene a meeting of BRIC labor ministers and BRIC education ministers, and we did it successfully actually two times, once in China with the BRIC education ministers and once in uh, Den Haag in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, in 2010, inviting the labor ministers or social development ministers from the BRIC countries. And it was very, very good. And actually, it was the time when Brazilian minister has uh, pledged to host uh, an international conference on child labor. And it is great that they have shown the leadership in hosting this conference, which begins tomorrow. Combater o trabalho infantil é atacar o financiamento daqueles que, que lucram com isso. Como está esse combate nesse momento? Actually, we should look this whole issue in a broader perspective and a very simple perspective. The simple perspective is that if you go to a farmer, a field worker, and ask, are you going to eat all your production? They said, no, we keep our best uh, grain as seed for the next year. And we invest on our uh, crop. We invest on trees. We have to wait because the trees or even crop are not going to give fruits in one day. And we have to uh, feed water, we have to feed fodders, and so on and so forth. So if you don't invest your, on your children today and you want to make them a machine of production, then in the future they are going to become sick, illiterate, poor people. So investment on children, on their education, health, and other things, is a future investment that will give much more return in the future. That is one. And as far as the economic uh, economics of this whole thing is concerned, uh, the new studies reveal that uh, one single year of schooling, primary schooling, helps uh, at an increase of 10 to 15 percent of earning uh, of a person in the future, every single year of primary schooling. And every single year of secondary uh, schooling helps in 20 to 25 percent increase in earning for the future. As far as the national gross uh, production is concerned, uh, there is another study which has been completed recently in 50 countries and which proves that one single year of schooling for children helps in 0.37 percent increase in uh, GNP. So that, that, that is very important. So no country can progress without educating its children now. Uh, so for sustainable economic growth, uh, sustainable ecology, sustainable business, it is very important that the education of children uh, has to be taken care of. And that is not possible without elimination of child labor. So, Depois de combater durante quase 30 anos o trabalho infantil, o seu sentimento de esperança no futuro permanece inabalável? I am very, very enthusiastic. I am very, very hopeful. I am very optimistic. And I am very sure, let me underline here, that I will see the end of child labor in my lifetime. Thank you very much for coming to Thank Muito you. obrigado por você ter vindo aqui Thank ao nosso you. programa. Cidadania conversou com Keilash Satyarthi, líder da Marcha Global contra o Trabalho Infantil. 
mande suas críticas e sugestões para nós. Ligue para 0800 61 22 11 ou acesse www.senado.leg.br barra TV. Nesse mesmo endereço você pode ver de novo ou baixar uma cópia deste ou de qualquer outro programa da TV Senado. Obrigado pela atenção e até o próximo Cidadania.